Hi, it's really lovely to see you. I'm here with my great friend, Lauren Harris, and we're gonna to chat today about chapter one of Less Is More, Mindless. Hey, Lauren, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks, good to be here. I'm so thrilled that you're here. So, so lovely to see you. Um, I just wanna introduce you to everybody that's watching. This is Lauren, she's married to Luke and she is mama to three gorgeous kids. She happens to be by day worship pastor at St. Aldate's Church in Oxford, and she's also a lover of fresh flowers, and she is a couch to 5K champion. It's lovely to be with you, Lauren. Could you just start just by telling us a little bit about your story, where you've come from, and where you're going? Yep, so thanks so much, Lou. It's great to be here today, just sharing some thoughts. Um, so I'm originally from High Wycombe, a little town just between Oxford and London. Um, I came to Oxford uh, many years ago to study at Oxford Brookes University, studied music, um, spent a few years sabbaticaling from the Lord, which was never a good idea. Did an internship as a worship intern here at Snow Dates and then joined the staff team in 2008. Um, yeah, and so then I've been on staff here for about 12 years, um, serving the worship team and, yeah, helping the church grow in its love for worshipping God, which has been amazing. And um, I'm married to Luke, and we have three lovely, beautiful kids. <laughs> I can't believe you've been on staff that long, my goodness. It is long, it's long. Years have flown by, my goodness me. So one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you particularly about this chapter of the book, as I document my own journey with uh, particularly postnatal depression, um, is I know that that's something that you've battled with and had to overcome and have overcome. Would you just tell us a little bit about that? I mean, I my my trigger for it, if you like, is the loss of my father. So for me, although that was some time ago before my diagnosis, actually, it was only as I came sort of into the fullness of what that diagnosis was and what it really meant for me that I was able to pinpoint and isolate what that initial trigger was. I just wondered, Lauren, is that, can you isolate that and say, I know it was this reason that I had this diagnosis, or do you think it was a whole host of other things? What was your experience? I think it's a challenge, isn't it? I think particularly when you land in a place of depression and you realise that that's where you are, um, it's difficult to pinpoint, but perhaps after you come out of that place or move forward on that journey, you can look back and see. And I think there were definitely a couple of um, trigger points for me that were actually circumstantial and that happened that kind of triggered off the depression. So partly we had quite a lot of issues with feeding my daughter when she was first born. So I had postnatal depression after my third child and I hadn't had it with my first two. Um, so we had feeding issues, she had tongue ties, we had to have appointments for that. So that kind of was really difficult. Um, we then had quite a few sleeping issues that triggered something else of tiredness and just inability to cope with the change and the rhythm of life with having three children at that point under five. Um, and I think then as well, in maybe six months after my daughter was born, my son got really unwell with a brain infection, went into hospital. Um, and so I think there are a lot of things that wore me down mm. and then the depression set in. So they're the kind of things that I've been able to look back and see as triggers for me, yeah, getting into a bad place really. And that's interesting, isn't it? You say being worn down, and I think that's so key, isn't it? As we understand this whole area of mental health, that actually it's not necessarily a massive explosive event. Like you say, it can just be the sense of being worn out by life and just expectations not being met or just disappointment and upset that we just gradually just get worn away. Like our souls just get worn away, don't they? And it's, and then, I don't know about you, but you just you sense that you're just so depleted and you don't know where to look anymore. It's almost like Jesus has gone right into the background and, and you're just looking at this sort of mess and this rubble in front of you going, is this my life? Is yeah. this all, is this all it is? Is this all it is? And that's so hard, isn't it, to live under? Yeah, I think for me it was just the layers, the yeah. layers of tiredness and trouble and disappointment mm. um, that just contributed to actually me not really being able to cope very well on my own anymore and getting a bit lost in my thoughts and disappointments. Um, so yeah, I think often it is a bit of an accumulation of just so many things. Yeah, definitely, definitely it is that. And I think in, I reference it in the book, but that brilliant verse is in Romans that in the message, it talks about depression being like a low lying cloud. 
And I think that's such a great description of what depression is. It's just this thing that sort of hovers just over your head yeah. and you can't shake it off and it's really difficult. I just, with this whole area as well, I just think it's really interesting, especially in church community. But when I was growing up, there's this kind of this weird theology about leaving your stuff at the door and like come to Jesus, but leave everything outside. And, and what it, in a way, cultivated in me and possibly others was this sense of faking it to make it. So I've got to then bring my best self to Jesus. My real self won't do. Do you think that the church culture, this is something you wrestle with as well. I'm not, I, you know, I wonder if it's something that we wrestle with this whole fake it to make it. Do we, do we almost accidentally sort of preach that? Do we live that? Um, this sort of smoke and mirror culture that we often hear about as well. I just wondered what, what your experience of that was, Lauren, or if you would agree or, or not with that observation. I think part of my reflection is that we're in a place of transition mm. and that for years and perhaps for, um, maybe us growing up as children, but also for our parents' generation in particular, um, mental health and the fact that you might not be okay on the inside has been shunned as something you is for behind closed doors almost, and it's not something to be brought out in public. And, um, you know, put on a brave face, deliver the best that you can. Um, and I think the church has definitely played its part in putting people up front and people in the limelight who are actually doing really well and managing to, you mm. know, allow God to really um, make their life as best as it can be. Um, but I do think that culture outside the church is influencing culture inside the church and things are changing. I think the rise of mental health awareness um, in our nation is impacting on the rise of mental health awareness in our church and rightly so and I've been privileged to be a part of some conversations with people mm -hmm. um, about what this looks like and how we have a responsibility to challenge it and to make a way for us to be able to bring our whole self as you said mm -hmm. past the doors and into the building and that we have as much to offer um, and actually as we unload that stuff in front of other people, it gives them permission to be themselves. And so I think we have a huge responsibility um, to not be shiny anymore and to actually be our real selves and for that to come across, you know, from an upfront, you know, perhaps leadership place. Um, so my feeling is that it's at a point of transition, but I'm glad of that because it's made me be able to be who I am as a leader today. Yeah then that's definitely my experience. I don't, I'm not saying for one minute, I'm still there, but it's just, just something I've noticed. And I think you're right that, that the tide is turning. Um, and like you say, there are some, you know, high profile, high profile people who are speaking up and out and saying, this is, this can't stay like this. And we need to have more of a conversation. I think that's, that is so good. There's um in the passion translation, there's a great version of Philippians four verses eight to 10 that says this, so keep your thoughts continually fixed on all that is authentic and real, honourable and admirable, beautiful and respectful, pure and holy, merciful and kind, and fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God, praising him always. And I think that's a real, um, that just makes my spirit roar in terms of, you know, how do we get eyes up? How do we get our heads out of, out from underneath the cloud of depression? How do we get our feet out of the rubble of our lives? And how do we look to the work and the, and the glorious work of God? And I, I wonder, Lauren, I know you're a worship pastor, so part of you has to do this as part of your CV, you know, worship the Lord. But truly, in your experience, how have you been able to fully embrace the promise of God that, that if you fix your eyes on him, that he, you know, he can do wonderful things in your life and through your life? Yeah, I mean, I think I love these big verses from Paul where you're just like, okay, not too much then. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it's really high level for me. <laughs> yeah. I don't think, you, you know, sometimes we can look at these and, you know, particularly if we're in a difficult place. But I do think that it is the only way to move forwards and not even really to move out of a place because I think we never know how long or when we're going to move out from one place to another emotionally, mentally. Um, but I do think that what Paul's saying here is that we have a vehicle that 
Jesus invites us to be in in order for him to help us to move along. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think worship for me was really hard when I was really low and I have sung my entire life from sitting in the car with my parents to Amy Grant. Now having the privilege of leading huge crowds of people to worship God. Um, but for me, when I was low, it was really difficult to engage. I actually just used to put on soundtracks of movie music to kind of like keep music alive, but to like dull out the words because I couldn't cope really. But um, I remember we did an album recording at our church um, when I kind of was in the thick of my depression. I just started my medication, so I was just starting to feel a bit better. And I remember kind of feeling so worried. I was like, God, how can I be authentic? How can I be real in this moment? Like, you know, this is being recorded on video. It's being recorded audially. I'm going to, you know, this is going to go out live. And I just remember God just being like, Lauren, don't believe that. I can't do exactly what I want to do through you as you just say yes to me and fix your eyes on me. So as this verse is, you know, calling to fix our gaze on the things that are beautiful, the things that are real, that are lovely. I think as we fix our eyes on Jesus, that lovely one, as I kind of lifted my gaze that night, he just like opened something up in me again that I'd obviously not been able to open up myself. And, you know, I think even in these small ways of us just saying, okay, Jesus, yeah, I accept you're this. And I know that you're that. He just takes us on little steps on our journey towards that place of healing that we know he has for us so good that's so great i love that you love amy grant she's just <laughs> yeah, she's a legend <laughs> anything practically for anybody listening today you just think this really helped me when i was really down or when i am really down this is these are the my go-to places yeah to help me i think um one of my go-to's is um, surrounding myself with people who are going to speak God's life into me. Um, and that might be people further afield who I know I could pick up the phone and call mm -hmm. like you, or it might be, um, friends nearby. It might be other mums. They might not be Christian people. They might be just friends at the school gate who I can be honest with. And that's one way. Another way is, you know, I found having scripture written around my house really helpful. I have a few pieces of artwork by Christian artists and just having the word of God like out and about around my house, you know, as I look around in despair, <laughs> finding words of hope. Yeah. Um, but also I think for me, something that's been really key is just being committed to playing worship music mm. around my home and even if it's in the background, allowing the presence of God to kind of seep in through the cement, really. Yeah. yeah. And into our existence together as a family. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, that's so helpful. But I think actually what you just said there about being committed to worship, I think that the word commitment in this is so key, isn't it? Yeah. That we have to just keep putting one foot in front of the other holding on to the promise of God, even if we don't feel like it, we've got that wall around our tent, around our spirits, around our, our minds, mm -hmm. but just to keep keeping on. And sometimes that's all we can do, isn't it? All we can do is just put one foot in front of the other. Um, yeah, that's so good, Lauren. Thank you for those practical things. And I think you're really right as well. It doesn't have to be necessarily Christian friends. It can be just people that who really know you and are for you. Um, just spending time with them can be such an encouragement just to make you laugh, you know? Yeah. You know, yeah. prayer and laughter, I think, probably have the same outcome, right? Sometimes it feels yeah, like, absolutely. It? you know, very therapeutic. So good for the soul. Yeah. So good for the soul. Lauren, I just wondered in closing, would you finish the sentence, less is more? Do you know what? I have been thinking about this. Um, to me, less is more means Jesus is the only way. He is the only place. And Less means um, to me getting rid of all those other voices mm. that can distract us from knowing that there's only one voice. Mm. There's only one place mm. where we can go to receive um, the words of life from, the words that lift us up, the words that keep us going, the words that 
give us excitement and joy and courage. So yeah, for me, less is more means Jesus is the one. I love that. The answer is always Jesus, right? That's what we've always been told. It's always him. It's always him. Yeah. Lauren, it's been such a joy to chat to you. Thank you so, so much for your time. I love spending time with you. I know it's not the same on a screen, but it's just so good to see your gorgeous face. Thank you so much. And I'll see you soon. Take care. Yeah. Bye-bye.